My wife is a linguist, and a while back, the two of us were attending the same conference in Kyoto. At the opening reception, I saw Yukari talking to a few of her Japanese colleagues that I didn't know, uh, off in the distance. So I thought this would be a great opportunity to surprise her with some new vocabulary I had just learned. After practicing a few times in my head, I approached the group and gave it a shot. My sentence had a few mistakes, but one was particularly amusing. I wanted to say, Kanichiwa Yukari no Shujin desu. What I actually said was, Kanichiwa Yukari no Shujin desu. Can you hear the difference? Shujin versus Shujin? Well, apparently neither could I, because instead of saying, Hello, I'm Yukari's husband, I said, Hello, I'm Yukari's prisoner. My mistake was that I mispronounced a single phoneme in the Japanese word for husband. This is an example of a minimal pair in phonetics. Shujin, husband, has a short U vowel, but Shujin, prisoner, has a long U vowel. In Japanese, that's the difference between your spouse being your wife or your jailer. These sorts of little mistakes and mis mispronunciations happen all the time when adults learn foreign languages. So common. This is noteworthy because it's much less common for young children learning their own native language. And when they do make a mistake, they can easily correct it. This is clearly one case where children are a lot smarter than adults. In today's lecture, we'll talk about the mechanisms that explain both of these phenomena. As you'll see, what makes it relatively easy to learn native speech sounds as a child is the flip side of what makes it so hard to learn them as an adult. There are many cases, there are many areas where you can say babies are more skilled than adults, but the ability to differentiate a diverse set of speech sounds is definitely one of them. Before we explore why this is, let me just say one thing about this section on development. For the next batch of lectures, I want to spend some extra time explaining the innovative methods that developmental scientists have used to explore the minds of infants. Unlike adults, we can't ask babies directly what they know and don't know. Instead, we must find creative ways to get inside the heads of these little creatures. This is no easy task, and it's just as challenging as any other scientific puzzle. There are almost 7,000 languages on the planet, and altogether, they're composed of hundreds and hundreds of different phonemes. Faced with such a diversity of speech sounds, you might see this as a classic blank slate sort of problem. It's not unreasonable to think that babies come into the world with very limited auditory abilities, and only through massive exposure and experience do they start to hear the sounds in their particular language. Makes sense, right? Well, that's not how evolution has solved the problem. Rather than coming in with blank slates, babies are evolutionarily designed to enter the world with some very impressive phonetic abilities. We have learned this from a groundbreaking line of work by several researchers on infant speech development. The pioneering paper was published in 1971 by the speech scientist Peter Imus and Peter Jusik at Brown University. Imus and Jusik were interested in whether babies could process phonemes categorically like adults do. For example, Japanese adults know that the short U phoneme in Shujin belongs to the category of short vowels, but the long U phoneme in Shujin belongs to the category of long vowels. This categorical distinction between vowel length doesn't exist in English. Elongating vowels in English may sometimes add a nuanced connotation to words, but it doesn't qualitatively and invariably change their meanings as it does in Japanese. If this is hard to get your head around, let's use a more familiar example from English. Consider the difference between the minimal pair of bat and pat. These words are phonetically identical, except for the ba and pa sounds. These are called stop consonants, and they're produced by a speaker completely stopping the flow of air from the vocal system, and then abruptly releasing it. The key difference between ba and pa is what the vocal cords do in relation to the release of airflow. Ba, 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 
Ba, ba. For ba, the vocal cords vibrate before the release, and for pa, they vibrate after it. Try it for yourself. Put your palm in front of your lips and then say the two words. The first thing you notice is that your lips, tongue, and vocal cords do the same thing for ba and pa. The second thing is that you can feel a puff of air with pa before you can feel, feel the vibration. Try it again. This delay is called voice onset time, or VOT, and it lasts only about 1 20th of a second. Now here's the interesting thing about how we perceive this difference. We do it categorically, not continuously. Here's how we know. You can use a computer to make speech synthesized versions of these two phonemes and then gradually adjust the number of milliseconds between the release of air and the vibration of the vocal cords. Then you can present this continuum to people to determine when they stop hearing ba and when they start hearing pa. Let's try it. Ba, 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 ba. Did you notice how the ba sounds switch to the pa sounds suddenly and not gradually? That shift happened right around zero milliseconds, which means that negative VOTs are perceived as ba and positive ones are perceived as pa. This suggests that the transition is categorical in nature. The differences in VOTs doesn't seem to matter much when they occur within a category, but they make a huge difference across categories. This phenomenon is known as categorical perception. All right, now that you know about categorical perception in adults, we can ask what babies do. But how could we ask young babies if they, if they hear different phonemes categorically or continuously? Solving this problem was the creative insight of Jusik and Imus. Their solution was to build on some very basic skills that human babies have built into their DNA. Taking advantage of the fact that babies are innately drawn to novel stimuli at birth, Jusik and Imus used preference for novelty as a way to determine whether babies could tell the difference between the phonemes. The way they measured this novelty preference was through a technique called habituation. The idea is that because babies prefer novelty, you can present the same thing to them, like a ba sound, over and over until they get bored with it. And then you can switch the stimulus on some key dimension, like presenting a pa sound, and record if they increase their attention to it. So how can you measure this increased attention in babies? Imus and Jusik took advantage of something that babies are born to do, suck. All babies have an innate reflex to suck more when they're interested and less when they're not. So the idea was to present babies a phoneme from one category over and over until they got bored. They sucked less and less and then measure what happened when the babies heard a new phoneme from a different category. If their sucking went up, that meant the baby heard a difference. If it stayed the same, that, that meant the baby didn't hear a difference. Pretty clever, huh? So what did they find? Remarkably, Jusik and Imus found that even babies as young as one month old could categorically distinguish ba from pa. It was categorical because when babies heard speech sounds that differed by the same VOT but within a category versus across it, they did not differentiate the sounds. In other words, when they heard a pa sound that had VOTs of plus 30 milliseconds and plus 10 milliseconds, they didn't treat them differently. It was only when the VOTs crossed the boundary, going from plus 10 milliseconds to minus 10 milliseconds, that babies noticed the difference. This means that just like adults, one-month-old babies categorically distinguish phonemes. It's worth adding that more recent work has shown that even newborn babies can do this. So this truly seems like an innate skill. But you may object. Maybe these babies are learning these speech sounds in utero. I mean, after all, we know from acoustic recording in the womb that a fetus can hear its mother's voice. Not only that, research from Judith Gervain at Université Paris Descartes has shown that prenatal babies learn the intonational patterns of their native language from their mother's voice. So it's possible that they could also be learning to categorically perceive native phonemes. How might you rule out this alternative explanation that prenatal exposure is the sole mechanism? 
The answer comes from one of my favorite studies in all of language development. In 1984, Janet Worker and Richard Tees of the University of British Columbia conducted a study with English-speaking six-month-olds to see if they could perceive phoneme differences in a language that they've never heard, Hindi. Hindi has particular phoneme contrasts that are very different from anything in English. And for native English-speaking adults, these are very hard to hear. For example, this is a minimal pair that differs mainly in how much breath is released in producing the ja sound. Bura. Bura. These two words have very different meanings in Hindi. The first means bad, and the second means drowned. Here, try them again. Bura. Bura. If you don't speak Hindi, that pair was hard to do, wasn't it? Now, if it's hard for you, it must be even harder for an infant, right? Well, actually, the surprising finding is that for babies, this is actually a very easy thing to do. In their study, Worker and Tees conditioned six-month-old English-speaking infants to turn their heads when they heard a difference between the two phonemes. Not only could babies do this easily for minimal pairs in English, but they could do it for minimal pairs in Hindi, too. These babies had never been exposed to a single Hindi contrast in their entire lives. So this ability was not learned from linguistic experience. Instead, it must be innate. By the way, this finding has been replicated with dozens of languages and with much younger babies too. So this is a very powerful and robust form of innate knowledge. Okay, so you may be wondering something. If you could differentiate all these phonemes when you were zero to six months old, and now you can only differentiate ones in your native language, what happened between then and now? In a follow-up study, Worker and Tees found that it was between the ages of six and